Hey, good morning. This is April 5th, 2014, and we're tapping maple trees, sugar maple trees, for the sap that's going to start flowing pretty soon. So how can you tell that it's a sugar maple tree? Well, you look at the bark. It's got scales, a lot of them, and they're random any place on the tree. Compared to the oak tree, which is right next there, you see it's got a pretty uniform bark with deep fissures. And compared with the red maple tree behind me here, the foolproof way of telling whether or not it's a sugar maple or a red maple is that red maples have flower buds on them already. They're very early. It's in a very, a very distinctive feature. So you get a sugar maple tree like this, and when the weather begins to thaw, about the time that a kid can make a good snowball. That's the time to think about tapping. Moreover, you can listen for the hoot owls because they're the first to nest. Uh, they feed on the migratory birds after their hatchlings have to be fed. And so they're early and that's about the time to get out there. Get your equipment together, get it cleaned up and get ready to go. So here's how we do it. Years past, I had a hand auger and I drilled, hand drilled, every one of the 450 holes that needed spiles. Uh, uh, but now it's so much more convenient to have, to have an electric drill which bores into the tree trunk. This is a hard wood and it does take a good deal of power to do it. So I'll begin drilling tap holes. The first thing is a, is a tap hole a little higher on the trunk. And another tap hole lower below and to the side of the first hole. The first tap is a piece of plastic tubing attached to a plastic spile and it gathers the sap from the hole and directs it to the pail. This one is tapped in. And you can tell when, when it's seated because the hammer will bounce off the spile. You hear that? And it makes a tattoo. That's deep enough. And then a metal spile. The metal spile, aluminum, is made with a hook on it to hold a sap pail. It too gets driven into the tap hole in the tree trunk. And again, you can tell when it's seated because the hammer will bounce. See? If you tap them too deep, pound them too deep, it'll crack the trunk. And then the sap will leak out above and below the spile through that crack and you lose the sap. Boy, it's nice to start off with such a nice flow. And it's still flowing now. There are some even small trees that produce prodigiously. He's got a double load. You hear the black capped chickadees making territory. We gathered the maple sap in. Today was a pretty good run. We got about 130 gallons of sap 
which is not bad for the first day to power button you got it yet. But it's a pretty good initial run. Now, I've had the trees tapped for a week and a half. Some days there was no flow at all. One day there was a flow of three gallons. And today, the conditions were just right. It got cold last night, 21 degrees. And this morning the sun came out. Though it was very windy. And the wind doesn't allow the twigs up in the crown of the tree to warm up and expand and pull the sap up. But today it was just enough to make a flow. Sap has got to be hauled by a bucket full from the gathering tanks. And I run it through a filter to take out the heavy debris, heavy pieces of dirt, moths, whatever else. Later on there will be bacteria that it will filter out. And by the pailful, it's dumped into the filter in this last cell of the entire pan. Here it warms up, sometimes even boils, but it slowly then runs from segment to segment through the pipes on the side. And by the time it gets to the front one over there, it's boiling. This being an old-fashioned operation, the sap is handled by hand. Bigger operations have pumps and pipes and regulators that control the amount of sap in the pans that are boiling. And very few operations burn wood anymore. Most of them burn fuel of some sort, propane or heating fuel. It cuts down quite a lot on the work, but they also run their sap through a reverse osmosis membrane. And the reverse osmosis membrane takes out a good percentage of the water out of the sap so that they have to boil the sap only about an hour. Now what they get is sweet, and it is maple syrup, but it does not have the intense maple flavor that four hours of boiling gives it. Somehow in the boiling, the elements, the minerals and so forth, combine in a way that it can't be done if it's only boiled for a short time. Now I'm skimming off the foam and perhaps you can see that foam is, almost looks brown. That's because the, the materials, the elements that we don't want comes to the top with the foam and it makes it a whole lot easier to filter the syrup when it's bottling time. When I say this is large hand work, that means making the wood by hand, carrying it in from the shed, and feeding the stove. Now this puppy here will get really hot after a while. So hot that if you're wearing polyester, it'll melt to you. But we need that heat to keep a good boil. Because on a good sapping day like today, I can't get all the sap into the cooking pan and I have to boil it down and keep adding in order to get it all in the pan the same day that it's gathered. If I don't, then bacteria grows and bacteria will, will ferment the sugar in the syrup and actually create vinegar. And so it's got it all be put into the pan and brought to a boil to kill the bacteria. And so sometimes there's more sap than I can fit in all the pans, so I have to keep boiling into the night until I get the room in and get it all up to boiling temperature. Then I go to bed. Next morning, come out here and finish it off. 
and if we have a bunch of good days running together, this is a busy place. Those are sandhill cranes. Yesterday was the first one I heard. And that's also a good sign of maple sap season. Here's some examples of the spiles that have been used over the years. Now, I remind you this is old fashioned maple sapping. The modern guys have tubes and vacuum pumps and uh, all sorts of equipment to handle the sap. So very little handwork. This is still the old-fashioned way lots of hand work. This is a handmade spile. It's made out of a black cherry branch. Black cherry because it's got a pithy material in here. You can just scrape it out. My grandpa made this. My grandpa who immigrated from Germany, oh gosh, 110 years ago I guess, made these by hand bored a hole in a tree, pounded them into the tree, and then just put some container right on the ground and it dripped into the container. And I remember as a kid, used to get moldy. It looked pretty awful, but that was good syrup. Then, in time, they came up with a manufactured spile. And this is a cast iron device. Very small, but that's all they needed. You had to be careful. You pounded on them too hard, they would shatter like glass because they were cast iron. But that's why they call it tapping because you tap it gently into the hole in the tree. That was the first manufactured type and now I use this kind. This is made of aluminum. Um, they're inserted into a hole that's 7 16 of an inch in diameter. And you can see that tapered body allows the sap then to run through the hole on the bottom and drip out into the pad. Convenient hook to hook the uh, sap pail on. Nothing goes into my sap. Nothing but hard work. <laughs> and the pleasure of being out in the woods at that time of the year. And listening to the sap hit the bottom of the sap pails like, like an orchestra out there in a good flow day. And the result is syrup that many people have told me exceeds the flavor of commercially produced maple syrup. Okay, well, we've boiled this half down for more than four hours. And, and now we're ready to take off, a, uh, take off the syrup. We know that it's syrup because when you look at the surface, you see these little circles all over? That is, shows that this syrup has got the right concentration and the right amount of sugar and it's time to take off. I don't fire very much here at the end because I don't want to scorch the bottom of the pans. So I let the fire down and it's now just about syrup. How do I know? My mom used to take a ladle of syrup and throw it in the snow and if it got gummy it was ready. Now, of course, I can do it in one of two ways. I can do something called uh, what they call sheeting in the candy making world. When you pour a little off the edge, when the drops come off perfectly round, it's not ready yet. But if they come off a little wider, notice that they're coming a little bit wider, it's called sheeting. And when it gets to that, that's also a sight. Again, people who make candy know that. There's another thing that we got to kind of protect for when it is that done and that's from boiling if you have too much heat it'll boil over suddenly the foam has a kind of a surface tension that doesn't let go and the way to prevent it, otherwise it'll boil over everything make a mess the way to prevent that is to take a piece of of uh, evergreen in this case balsam fir and all you have to do is just, it, it, it starts mounting up, all you have to do is pass this through like that and the foam goes right down. It just eliminates. What this does apparently is to transfer a little bit of oil to the top. My mom used to use a bacon rind to do the same thing, to knock the foam down. But I control it by cutting down on the amount of fuel I've got and the amount of wood I add to this so I can control the temperature. Now it's ready to go to serve. So I'll do a sample in my hydrometer, and my hydrometer is nothing more than a scale with a weight on the end, and it measures 
density so that when this becomes very dense with a lot of sugar and very little water it pushes the hydrometer up and you can read the scale off the side of the hydrometer and you know when you have syrup notice that it kind of pours like water it's real thin that's because it's hot once it cools off it thickens okay see see the hydrometer pop up floating all I do is lift it up a little bit and there's a red mark that's what I'm shooting for is that red mark that red mark indicates density enough to be syrup I don't run it all the way to that red mark here on the pans but when it comes time to bottle the syrup then I cook more of it off and to that red mark and then it's perfect everything is the same pail hanging here faucet turned on and that's syrup I gathered in these pails and eventually store it in the milk cans that I have for that purpose until the sapping season is over. After the sapping season comes the bottling season. And at that time, in the kitchen stove in the back of the room here, I heat all this syrup up, run it through a filter press, and bottle it at 200 degrees, store it in my covers and then start making distributions. I don't sell syrup. I enjoy harvesting it. I enjoy the company that comes. I enjoy my neighbor, Julie, working with the sap and the cooking and so forth. But with eight children and 16 grandchildren, I've always got a good place to share my syrup. That stuff is just the right color for maple syrup. That tells you that it is flavorful. This is diatomaceous earth. Diatoms are little marine critters that produced a shell, a calcium shell, millions of years ago. Those little, those little things somehow grab on, glom onto the dirt, the odd solids that we find in maple syrup. What I'm doing now is stirring it out very, very nice so I get a good suspension of it. And when that stuff kind of bonds up with the syrup, then the filter, the papers work properly. So we see with the filtering, everything's working wonderful. This is filtered syrup here, it's filling up this pan is going down. Oh, that's good looking syrup. This is a light amber, light amber syrup, this can, nice looking syrup.